Because today, the contradictions within the cabinet about the likelihood of being able to book a summer holiday have, for good or for ill, risen to near the top of the news agenda. Now, you can understand why most right-wing media would be desperate to talk about anything other than Brexit at the moment. I don't know if you've been following proceedings, but just off the top of my head, um, it looks like the shellfish industry is about to wither on the vine because, well, I think there's quite a strong case to be made for claiming that Michael Gove didn't understand what he was signing. Um, speaking of people who don't understand stuff, Kate Hoey took about, what's the date today? 20, what's the, what is the date today? Actually, I should probably should check before I come on air. Don't, don't say it in my ear. This is theatre. I know that it's the 11th. I'm pretending not to in order to create tension in the mind of the listener. So it's taken... How many days are there in January? 30 days, 31. 31 plus 11 is 42. It's taken 42 days for Kate Hoey to move from coming close to claiming that anybody who didn't back Boris Johnson's oven-ready deal was, uh, was some sort of traitor to the, to, the, to the UK cause to claiming that the Northern Ireland Protocol that was an intrinsic part of that oven-ready deal, um, sort of, is disastrous and needs to be fixed immediately. 42 days. E even this condescending, sneering public schoolboy Ramona didn't think that it would start falling apart that quickly. Amsterdam has overtaken London as Europe's top share trading hub. Um, 10 quid to anyone who can cast that as good news or a tangible benefit of Brexit. We've got £1 billion worth of Brexit red tape coming in for chemicals. The Northern Ireland Protocol, as I say, is falling apart at the seams and it would appear that Michael Gove's decision to try to weaponise Ursula von der Leyen's flirtation with a terrible mistake um, one Friday afternoon in January has uh, come back around to bite him on the backside. Half of exporters to the EU are having Brexit difficulties, according to a new survey. That counts as good news, right? I would cast that as only half of uh, UK exporters to the EU. We've got the Governor of the Bank of England warning that the uh, necessary trade deal or the deeply desired trade agreement on financial services is, is currently looking rather sticky, stuck in the long grass, but hopefully only temporarily. What, what else have we got? I mean, this is just from the last two days. Another massive lorry park has been cleared in Dover, which, of course, was a very pro-leave part of the country. Lord Frost has started whining about the relationship being more than bumpy since the deal he was patted on the back for signing, even perhaps ennobled, wasn't he? Um, we could go on. Small businesses are drowning in paperwork and facing higher costs. Food traders, particularly in Scotland, have already warned of price rises and potential shortages. And do you want to know what they're really... Oh, and JD Sports, of course. Um, talking about the possibility of, well, the loss of millions of pounds and the possibility of transferring uh, uh, store warehouse distribution centres and therefore, of course, a large number of jobs to continental Europe and that is just if you include the JD sports story that takes us back to Tuesday the rest of those stories are confined to today and yesterday my dossier of Brexit related news is currently this thick and that's 42 days in that that sound effect didn't really work very well can someone go and get me an encyclopedia Britannica or, or, or a large paper dictionary so it, it, all I've got on my dossier of Brexit related news starting from the beginning of this year is, is headlines and then sometimes a um, a paragraph, no more than a paragraph of news and, and it now numbers about 34 pages or more all of which is culled from the national and international media. So what's your favourite right wing newspaper talking about today with regard to Brexit? The, the mind boggles at how you seek to spin this as, as a positive. So we may get onto that later in the programme. That doesn't work either, does it? Well, can, we, can we just get a thud? Is it like a sound effects library or something like that? What about Nick Abbott? Nick Abbott will have something stored on a disc somewhere, won't he? Like the sound of a really hefty... Um, but that would be dishonest. I tell you what, give it another 42 days. It'll be the size of Encyclopedia Britannica, so we'll just keep the genuine sound effect. This is my Brexit dossier. Did that, is that any better? All right. Dear 42. Um... <laughs> It's so it's so horrible now to see all of this, to see the fishermen going under, to see the peace process in Northern Ireland under mortal threat, to see uh, the red tape for every exporter in the land pretty much mounting at a, at a rate of knots. It, 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 it's genuinely heartbreaking. 
And I, I know I invest a little bit too much in myself in my work. That's that's how I am. I, and and I, I don't. I think it's too late ever to change. And I'm not in, even sure I would want to. But the anger and the upset among people who are still not quite ready to acknowledge the con. And when you do, God knows how we're going to play it. We can't get back in anytime soon. Maybe we could get back into the single market, go after some sort of uh, um, EEA or EFTA type arrangement, but and then just not mention the fact that that reopens freedom of movement of people, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing, completely corrupted and polluted by uh, people. There you go, like Nigel Farage. But it is horrible. It's just horrible to see this, especially the people that voted for it. The fishing community most obviously and most um, urgently. This... George Eustace, I, 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 even I haven't got the words. The one that, you know what, the four words I don't use are, because I, I put £10 in a charity tin every time I say them out loud, but apart from those four words, I don't have the words to do it yet. And I will need your help. But the first thing we can do together is just acknowledge reality. And, and I know that the entire Brexit project was built on denying reality. But, but a lot of people, and, and I, I care for you, you know, that's, that's my entire political project. My entire political outlook in life is built upon wanting what's best for all of us. And, and the, the clear evidence that Brexit would not be good for you, unless, unless you honestly think that a misunderstood meaning of sovereignty or the colour of your bra passport was more important than your children's future or your economic health or the contents of your bank account or your livelihood or your job or your business unless you honestly and, and forgive me but i don't believe you if you tell me that i, I honestly it's all worth it because i've got a blue passport or it's all worth it because i i don't know what sovereignty means but i believe that we've got more of it I, I just don't know how to do it at the moment because the evidence is incredible and watching or listening or reading some of the people in my line of work, um, the contortions they're having to undertake now. How, for example, would a, would a financial, quote, expert, end quote, who was pro-Brexit, how would they deal with the news that Amsterdam overtook us in January, overtook London um, as, as the major trading hub for European trade? So how do you, I saw, saw some people on Twitter responding by saying, I say some people. I saw two people with almost identical tweets, which of course makes you wonder whether they've come out of some sort of troll farm or, 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 or template. But, you know, how do you process the fact that Amsterdam has overtaken London as Europe's top share trading hub if you were telling people that all the warnings about damage being done to the city were wrong? How do you get out of bed in the morning? How do you lie straight at night? And the answer is you're made differently from, from some of us, is that you just sort of chalk it all up pretend it never happened and move on. But I can't, because my job is to bring you the knowledge and the information that you need. It's just that some days I can't, I just, I, I guess what I'm saying, I got a lovely letter, and I'm not going to give you too many details, but I, I got a really remarkable letter yesterday. It's handwritten, and I'm certainly not going to tell you his name. But it's a, a letter from someone who said, t two years ago, I adopted a, a, a and some people may recognise this, um, Two years ago, I adopted a spiritual way of living as a solution to my drinking problem, James. Uh, an essential part of this is to clear the wreckage of my past. And, and he goes on to say, I, I've recognized in doing this that in the past I've been bitter and angry at you and your belief beliefs. Um, I want to make amends for what I have done in my past. My views took me down roads like racism and xenophobia. And it's it must be so hard to write stuff like this, even though, you know, I get so much of this that I, I can't, in all conscience, claim to know which one of, of, of the many, many people who bring their racism and their xenophobia to my yard every day on social media, this one might be. Um, for a start, I imagine if he, if he came after me on Twitter, he probably didn't use his real name, but he uses it in this letter, which is why I shall reply, honestly and, and politely. But that, that's just so obviously going to happen to a lot of people. I hope it doesn't involve tackling alcoholism and, and, and things like that. But xenophobia and racism are consequences of anger and bitterness. It is incredibly successful for rich people to tell you that the reason why your life isn't going as well as you want is because of people below you in the social order, below you in the pecking order. 
you know? And, and if you think I'm exaggerating, I'll say this again. Make a list of all the people with big, big platforms in the British media who actually hold opinions like mine. Go on. Because if they work for the BBC, you don't know what their opinions are. You might think you do, but you don't. Unless, of course, they combine their BBC work with, with chairing a company that publishes a, a magazine possessed of incredibly strong political opinions, then you could probably join the dots. And although you'd be left asking questions about how the hell you'd be allowed to publish a magazine that routinely platforms everyone from Nazi apologists to the founder of the Proud Boys, while simultaneously observing the BBC's rules of impartiality, that's a question only Andrew Neil can answer. But for the rest of us, how many people, seriously, can you name in the British media who routinely say, if you haven't got enough, the problem is probably caused by the people who've got too much, rather than some poor sod in a dinghy running the risk of drowning off Dover. So that, that letter moved me on a, on a level I wasn't expecting, because I guess I live in hope that with a little bit of help, people can shrug off that, that sort of bitterness, that sort of hatred which almost always manifests itself in, in, in a variety of bigotries, racism and xenophobia, homophobia, anti-Semitism being among the most obvious. But Brexit's horrible because Brexit weaponized all of that bitterness. Say it again, said it a million times, doesn't matter, people like Dominic Raab can lie on this radio station about my own stated position and get away with it, unchallenged, end up being foreign secretary, but it doesn't stop me telling you the truth. It's absolutely ridiculous to suggest that everyone who voted for Brexit was harbouring racist views. But I'm yet to meet anyone who harbours racist views that wasn't much, much warmer towards Brexit than the rest of us. And racist views are stupid. And they hurt you as much as they hurt the person you're directing your anger and your bitterness at. So that letter really got me. And I think that's why I can't talk about Brexit today, because th there's a limit to how much of that bitterness and, and anger and hatred you can um, deal with. And, and it's going to get really, really ugly, because if you are still in that category, then I think you're going to get angry with me before you get angry with the people that sold it to you. I think, I, let me rephrase that. I think you're going to continue getting angrier with me. So have we got the clip of Kate Hoey from yesterday? Have we got, have we got that ready? Because that was astonishing. 42 days in. And Kate Hoey, who sat on a boat with Nigel Flipping Farage, was <laughs> complaining about what's happening in Northern Ireland. How many times did I sit here and say to you, I'm just doing a monologue on this and then we'll go back to the holidays. But I, I, I just want to get this off my chest, partly because that letter's moved me so much and partly because even I on day 42, can't quite believe the sheer weight of evidence, never mind the amount of red tape and difficulties, the sheer weight of evidence that the people now in charge have been lying to you for five years straight. Not just Dominic Raab, all of them. All of them. And now the proof of the pudding is in the eating, except Kate Hoey is claiming that's not the pudding she ordered. Go back to, to what was it, December? Let's go back to the vote, the big vote. You remember the oven-ready deal? The big celebration on Christmas Eve? That was Christmas Eve 2020. It's now February 2021, and Michael Gove is complaining about the deal that he heralded as a glorious victory six short weeks ago. In six weeks, or seven weeks, to segue from all hail the mighty deal, we are glorious victors in this negotiation to saying, oh, this is awful. I had no idea it was going to be like this. Gove's gone from glorious victory to appalling victimization in the blink of an eye. And it will probably work for the reason I've just explained. You're not ready yet to get cross with Michael Gove or Kate Hoey. You're going to carry on getting cross with me because all of the things I told you were going to happen are going to come true and you're going to try and pretend that it's my fault. I'm being a little bit self-aggrandizing, but it's my program. So I, I'm talking specifically in the context of people listening to this. I don't think anyone's under any illusions about the, the extent of my influence. It's negligible, except on people who listen to the radio show. And if you listen to this radio show and you're a bit like my correspondent there, he, he's shown you the light. You don't have to live your life like this. You don't have to live your life thinking that hatred and bitterness are, are not only the only way to be, but also that everybody who you hate is full of hatred and bitterness as well. I promise you we're not. The truth can set you free. And the truth is, it's hard to imagine Brexit going any worse. 
than it's currently going. And we're only 42 days in, and there is no reverse gear. We can't get out of it. So what are we going to do, you and me? Are we just going to close our eyes, put our fingers in our ears, and, and, and quotes, get on with it, end quotes, while never admitting the con that's been visited upon our wonderful country? We're going to start accusing people who, who, who think that damaging British interest is a bad thing to do, of somehow being unpatriotic, I beg your pardon. Are we going to carry on accusing people who think that damaging our country, holding our economy, ending whole industries, uh, abolishing freedoms, that's, that's, those of us who don't like that are unpatriotic, and those of us who do it somehow love their country? Is that what we're going to do? Just become a nation of of blindfolded sheep all going along with it? Well, not on this show. <laughs>